each in all waters. Ikapo shataya bayata. Zula bado shataya ba. Father, we give you praise. Thank you, Lord. In the name of Jesus. As in the name of Jesus. Let's celebrate our papa. Celebrate our mama in the house this morning with a clap. With a good shout. A shout of joy. Somebody shout glory. Good morning, Papa. Good morning, Mama. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands above our heads as we receive the word this morning. Put your hands together. Let's receive our Papa, Dr. Abel Damina. Glory. Somebody bless this morning. Shout a powerful amen. amen. Lift your right hands to heaven. Father, we rejoice that this morning we have this another opportunity to fellowship in the light of your word. And we are grateful that in destruction. Oh, thank you, Lord. You forgive all my sins and all of my iniquities. You renew it my youth like an eagle. It is you, Lord, that has been our strength, our shield, our deliverer, our keeper, our preserver, our sustainer, our mighty one, our refuge, our hiding place. Ziko Takeledebo. We dwell in the secret place of the Most High. We abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And we rejoice that in Christ Jesus we are eternally preserved. Your people are built up, equipped, edified. And Jesus is God. It's my nature. I do not struggle to do the word. I do the word naturally. Therefore, to Johannesburg, South Africa. What a joy to know that the world is growing mightily all over the nation of South Africa and all of the Sadiq region. Really excited. I'm excited about what God is doing with all of you in South Africa, especially the Johannesburg Pastor Apostle Shepherd Campus. We're really excited about what's going on there. The address is 15 Helen Joseph Street, Newtown, Johannesburg. For those of you that are in Johannesburg joining the service, you can drive there quickly and join the brethren. 15 Helen Joseph Street, Newtown, in Johannesburg, South Africa. Glory to God. All right, let's get in the word this morning. We've been looking at how to love God on his own terms. How to love God on his own terms. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18 to 20. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Next verse. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. <clears throat> now, there's something out there that Matthew seeks to let us see. The word, lo, I am. Lo, I am. When you say lo, it's the word horao in the Greek. It means look closely or look intently. I am with you. Look closely or look intently. I am with you. Now, I gave you the background that this study is not just Jesus, you know, speaking a speech. Or Jesus just speaking as one that is inspired. He is teaching from the Old Testament. I have told you that every time you are reading the four Gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, you are reading the Old Testament. Whenever you are reading the epistles, the epistles, you are reading both the Old Testament and the four Gospels. We have also established that the background of the four Gospels is Genesis to Malachi. The background of the four Gospels is Genesis to Malachi. And that the backgrounds of the prophets is the law or Exodus to Deuteronomy. The background of the prophets is Exodus to Deuteronomy. That is, the prophets are prophesying about it. Or, the prophets are speaking from the law and the Psalms. Now, the background of Exodus to Deuteronomy is the book of Genesis. The background of Exodus to Deuteronomy is the book of Genesis. Every time you read a book, 
you must decipher what is this book trying to resolve in their own day. Like I've told you before, you must sit where they sat to hear what they heard. That is, what study does he use in communicating the things he communicated in that particular book? Sometimes we over-spiritualize the reading of scripture and we miss the point that the scripture seeks to communicate. Remember, it's a first book. So the first thing is, what is the four gospels talking about? Because Matthew is part of the four gospels. And Matthew was writing concerning what Jesus had just communicated in 40 days with the disciples after resurrection. Then we must also be able to look at and say, well, it means that the prophecies of the Old Testament have been fulfilled. When Jesus will say, lo, I am with you always to the end of the world. Amen. Now, what are the prophecies of the Old Testament? You've got to look out for what the prophecies of the Old Testament are. You pick out the prophets. What are the prophets talking about? You must also realize that there are major prophets and there are minor prophets. So you, you want to find out what are the prophets, both major and minor, what are they talking about? That, that, that They're talking about a deliverance that is coming, that an exodus is coming, or a salvation plan that God started in exodus. That is the message of the prophets, that deliverance is coming, an exodus a salvation plan that God started in the book of Exodus. Why was there an Exodus at all? Why was there an Exodus at all? To go to the promised land in Deuteronomy. Because there is a promise in Genesis. The Exodus is about a journey to a promised land in Deuteronomy. Because there is a promise of an exodus in Genesis. So because there is the promise of an exodus in Genesis, the exodus is to go to a promised land in Deuteronomy. Are you following? The exodus is to go to a promised land in Deuteronomy because there is the promise of the exodus in Genesis. So Genesis is the promise of an exodus that will occur in Deuteronomy. Are you following? Now, so you have to read everything together. Today, we have the luxury and the challenge of verses and chapters. The luxury and the challenge of verses and chapters. Because nobody in Jesus' day used to quote. Because there was nothing to quote. Nobody in Jesus' day used to quote John 3.3, 3, except a man be born again. He cannot see the kingdom of God. There was nothing like that. There was nothing to quote. In Jesus' day, if you say Genesis 15.5, they don't know what you're talking about. They don't understand what you mean by Genesis 15.5. They, you know, they wouldn't even know what you're trying to communicate. So, if you refer to something in Genesis... What you were referring to is the whole book. If you say Genesis said, what you were telling them is to read from chapter 1 to the last chapter. And then there were no chapters. There were no verses. So if you say Genesis, what you mean is from the beginning to the end. If you're teaching and you say like in the book of Exodus, the man teaching expected the audience to have read all of Exodus. So when he's saying Exodus, they have an entire overview, an entire understanding of the context of Exodus. So when he's saying something from Exodus, everybody knows the whole story. So if he picks out an instance, they are seeing the instance from the background of the overview of the book. Am I communicating at all? Because there were no chapters and verses. Every text you see in the epistles carries with it a whole book. Every text in the epistles carries with it a whole book. 
a whole world view and again a context of things that happened before it every every text you find in the epistles carries with it a whole book a whole world a whole world view and again a context of things that happened before it and that is how we study that is how we study so if you're really serious about your study about god or his word you will not take the study of god's word lightly you will not joke with it at all you will not be casual about it <laughs> you will not be casual you will not be light about it you will be aggressive you will be diligent you will be dogged because there is a diligence and a doggedness required in the understanding of God from the context of his world. Please pay attention. So Jesus in Matthew 28 is teaching from the scriptures. Brother Luke in Luke 24, 25 will say, O fool, slow of heart, to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory and beginning at Moses. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets. He expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So he informs us that he did it from Moses and all the prophets. In verse 44 of that same chapter, he says, these are the words which I speak unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. Then opened he their understanding that they might understand the scriptures. So in Matthew chapter 28 verse 20, when Jesus now said unto them, Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always. And lo, I am. Pick out the word I am. I am. The word I am is two words in the Greek. Ego imai. E-G-O-E-M-I. Ego imai. Two words. Ego is a personal pronoun. Then the word am, imai, is to exist. To exist. It is used for both past, present, and future. It is used for both past, present, and future. Those of you that are looking at me, you're not writing anything. Are you watching movie or drama? How can I be delivering this wealth of information... And you're just looking at me. Did you come to church at all? Or you're looking for where to relax among people? You can go to a beer parlor, you know. Because in a beer parlor, you don't need a note and a biro. I forbid anybody in this church being casual about the word of God. I forbid it. I can't pastor you if you're not serious about the word of God. There are churches in town where you can go and dance for three hours and have a good time. Not here. Here we are serious about the word of God and your attitude must express it. Because I'm not playing. We're not here to play at all. If you're new, drop the newness today and take on the culture of studying. Because we're not playing games. I'm very serious about it. So if anybody is sitting up around you without a pen and a biro, tear a piece of paper and give to him now. And tell him I'm watching you. Well, we're not playing here. I'm very serious about it. We're not playing here. There's no way you can convince me that all this wealth of information I'm giving are registering in your head. There's no way. There's no way. I'm pouring a lot of stuff here. Even if you plan to buy the material after the service, there is a quality of understanding you writing delivers to your understanding. We're not playing. 
It's better you stay at home than come here and be discouraging those sitting around you with an unserious spirit. He that keepeth company with a, with, with a poor man, with a wise man, will be wise. He that makes company with a lazy person will be lazy. You don't want to sit. You yourself don't want to sit around somebody who is discouraging. Say, I hear you. After all of this, you come and ask a very stupid question. What does the book of Exodus mean? It means your father's house. When I was growing up as a Christian, if somebody sat me down the, day, the way I'm sitting you and taught me the things I'm teaching you, I wouldn't have committed blunders as a believer. Let me catch you looking at me when you should be writing. I will stone you with my shoe. You see, this shoe doesn't have a rope. I'll just pull it and stone you with it. And if I catch you sleeping when I'm teaching, I will step on your leg. So you wake up properly. Say, I hear. Okay, let's move. <clears throat> the word I am is the Greek. There are two words, ego, imai. Ego is a personal pronoun. Then the word am, 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 imai means to exist. It is used for both past, present, and future. So when he says, I am with you always, he echoes the conversation that God himself had with Moses. I am with you always. When Jesus said that, he was echoing a conversation that God had with Moses. In Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, put it up for me. Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Moses was saying to God, what name do I call you? And like I explained to you the other day, that in the eastern world, the near eastern culture, they worshipped idols. In fact, it's from the idols that you have the word El. El Shaddai. El Elyon. Elohim. El Gibo. The word El, E-L, came from idol worship. Their culture used the El to refer to a man-made God that way in Bible days. So they oftentimes refer to God's gods, G-O-D-S, their gods, based on weather, the weather, based on natural occurrences, based on evil, they refer to gods based on violence, based on fruitfulness, or based on infertility. Or they refer to gods based on wickedness, evil, or goodness. So they had names for those things. The god of thunder, the god of lightning, the god of iron, the god of earthquakes, the god that killeth. The God that destroyed it. They had different names for those gods. And they used the word El. El something. El Shaddai. El this. El that. All those were names given to gods in Bible days. So when Moses says to God, what do I call you? He is saying, those guys I'm going to are idol worshippers. They won't hear all this grammar that we are talking. What name do I call you? Or what authority do I tell them has sent me? So in God's graciousness, in God's what? Graciousness, he answers him. He says, I am that I am. In other words, what he is saying to Moses is, I was in Genesis. I was in Genesis. The one who gave the promise to Abraham. I am here to fulfill it. And I will yet fulfill it in the future. I am, I was, I am, I will be. So it's not a blank statement. I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
I was. That's when I gave the promise. I am here to fulfill it. I am taking you to the land. The word I am is the word Eva in the Hebrew. Eva. A-V-A. I gave the promise. I am doing it now. And I will do it then. So he says that to say, I am not one of the gods of Egypt. I gave a promise to Abraham. I am the one who gave that promise. And I am here to fulfill that promise. And I will yet fulfill it. So therefore it means that the word I am rests upon a story. The word I am rests upon a story. The word I am that I am and I will be what I will be rests upon a story. Please pay attention. If you don't understand the promise given to Abraham, the word I am can be clear to you. In order for the word I am to be clear to you, you must understand what promise did God give to Abraham. Let's go to Exodus chapter 6. Now please look at me everybody. In Exodus chapter 6 where we are about to read. Most skeptics, most skeptics look out for the high point of scripture so they can hit on the Exodus story. And they will tell you that the Exodus story never existed. It never existed. That's what most skeptics will tell you. They will tell you that the Exodus story never happened. Now, if you remove the Exodus story from scripture, then it means Jesus never came. That's the heart of Bible doctrine. Remember, I told you last Sunday, Moses gave us the building blocks of Bible doctrine. Did I say that? Moses. He's the father of Bible doctrine. So most skeptics, when they want to attack Christianity, they attack the Exodus account. Because they know that the heart of Bible teaching is in the Exodus. They will tell you it never happened because they know that within those accounts rest the coming of Jesus. Within the accounts of the Exodus. If those accounts didn't happen, then Jesus came to do nothing. Or he never came at all. So these accounts and events are interwoven or they are interrelated. So let's get there. Gen Exodus chapter 6 verse number 2. Exodus 6 verse number 2. And God spake unto Moses and said unto him, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. Ava. The word I the Lord. I the I am. Look at verse 3 of Exodus chapter 6. Please pay attention. And I appeared unto Abraham, unto Isaac, and unto Jacob by the name of God Almighty. But by my name Jehovah was I not known to them. Remember, in Exodus 3.14, go there, Exodus 3.14, because I want to read something. And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thou shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am has sent me unto you. Then in verse 16 and 17, look at what he now promises them of that Exodus chapter 3. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob, appeared unto me saying, I have surely visited you, and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. Next verse. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites. I will bring you up unto the land. I am, I was, and now in the future. So Exodus chapter 6 verse 3, please pay attention. He says, by my name almighty, I was known to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The word almighty, by my name almighty, there is the word Shaddai. Shaddai. 
Shaddai. It means to overpower. It means to overwhelm. It means to overcome. Shaddai. Shaddai. Some, some also call it the double-breasted one. Some people call it the all-sufficient one. Shaddai. But it actually means to overcome and to overpower. Shaddai. Is used against an intending enemy. The word Shaddai is used against an intending enemy. Also, is used concerning a situation that comes to crush. A situation that comes to crush or comes to destroy. It is used against a situation that comes to crush or comes to destroy. So, when he says, I am Shaddai or El Shaddai, by that was I known to Abraham and Jacob. What brother Matthew therefore is saying to us is, Matthew 28, 20, in the account of Jesus, lo, I am with you always. He is saying that the promise made to Abraham has now been fulfilled. That's what Matthew is telling us. That that promise that God made to Abraham of an exodus, where God promised to bring them out and take them to a land, has now been fulfilled. That's why in Matthew 28, 20, now says, I am with you always to the end of the world. If you back off a little and you watch the story of Jesus in the book of Matthew 1 21. Matthew chapter 1 verse 21. She shall bring forth a son and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. He shall save. He shall save. Exodus. Exodus. He shall save his people from their sins. The mission of Jesus was the exodus. That was promised to Abraham that took effect in Exodus of a land in Deuteronomy, which is the land that the redemptive sacrifice has given to us. I don't know if you are following what I'm saying here. Please stay with me. So, God promised them an Exodus. So, Jesus came to save his people from their sins. In verse 23 of that same Matthew chapter 1, Matthew 1, 23, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel. Emmanuel, which being interpreted, is God with us. God where? With us. He shall save his people. After saving his people, he will be with us. Matthew doesn't leave us without a doubt on who was tabernacling in Mary. You shall call his name Jesus. In Matthew chapter 2 verse 11. Matthew chapter 2 verse number 11. And when they were coming to the house, they sung the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. And when they had opened their treasures, they presented unto him gifts, gold and frankincense and myrrh. Wise men came to worship Jesus the king. In Matthew chapter 2 verse number 4 the Christ should be born in Bethlehem. He should be born in Bethlehem to fulfill the prophecy of the prophets. He should be born in Bethlehem. Alright? Now, observe also in Matthew chapter 3 verse 3. Please pay attention. Matthew chapter 3 verse 3. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah. So Isaiah spoke this, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Isaiah's prophecy concerning John the Baptist. Look at Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3, where he quotes, where Matthew is quoting from. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3. The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Then if you read further, you will see in verse 6, 7, and 8, give me verse 6, 7, and 8 of Isaiah 40. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the godliness thereof is as the flower of the field. 
The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the word of God shall stand forever. Next verse. Give me the next verse. O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the mountain, O Jerusalem, that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift it up. Be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. So Matthew expects you to have seen the narrative from chapter 1. Before he arrived at chapter 28. Chapter 1, she shall bring forth a son. His name shall be called Jesus. Why? He shall save. Then he, he, he shall not only save, he shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. God with us. John the Baptist prepared the way. Then in chapter 28, Lo, I am with you always. So when Matthew was writing chapter 28, he expected that you have had the background understanding of from chapter 1. Are you still here? Now, you must also realize that when he says, I am with you, Matthew is saying, this is coming to pass now. The promised Messiah, the promised Savior. So go back to Exodus. When he says, I am that I am. There's an echo somewhere. When he said, I am that I am. There's an echo somewhere. And that echo is within the context of Genesis chapter 1. So go back to Genesis chapter 1 verse number 1. Bereshit Elohim Barat et Shamayim's letter aret. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. This is not the creation of planets. This is the expression of an intent. This is God expressing his intent. Not for creation, but for the new creation. In the beginning, God's intent was there will be heaven in the earth. God created heaven and earth. Immortality in mortality. All right. Keep that somewhere. It will come in handy. So that you will know that God is not talking about the creation of the world, but using a parable. In verse 2, he now says, Genesis 1, 2, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. The earth was tohua bohua, without form and void, nothing, nothing. That already tells you that what he's talking about here is a parable. He's not talking creation. He's teaching Using a parable. Verse 3. And God said. Let there be light. Or the original says. God said light be. And light was. The Hebrew is light be. That word be is the same word I am. Ava. Light I am. Light I am. Or light Ava. So from Genesis, he's saying here, I am light. I am light. He doesn't stop there. Then he says in verse 11, look at building blocks now. Genesis 1, 11. <clears throat> and God said, let the earth bring forth grass, the herb yielding seed, and the fruit yielding fruit after his kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Fruit after its kind. Seed. 
Then in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15, he shows you that the seed he's talking about in Genesis 1.11 is the seed of the woman. He's building on the building blocks. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. And to Abraham he says, it is your seed that shall inherit the earth. The seed of Abraham. So which means that God will be everything that man needs in salvation. God will be everything that man needs in salvation. That is the word I am. I will be sufficient to everything you need in salvation. I am. I am what I am. I will be what I will be that is needed for salvation. You didn't get that. I am what I am. I will be what I will be that is needed in salvation. All right? Which means he says to Abraham in Genesis 17 1, I am Shaddai. I am Shaddai. Walk before me and be thou perfect. I am Shaddai. I am sufficient to be a savior. I am sufficient to be the seed. I am sufficient to be the light. I am sufficient to be the son. I am sufficient to be the servant. I am sufficient to be the king. I am sufficient to be the nation. That is the almightiness of God. I am that I am. I will be whatever I want to be with the purpose of an exodus promise fulfilled. I'm teaching good. You are writing good. So which means that when God makes a promise, he fulfills it by himself. It is always a self-fulfilling promise. This is the reason why many people struggle with the concept of the Trinity. <laughs> they struggle with it. Because they wonder, how can God be all this? God should just be one singular entity who makes us do things. That's how they think. They can't phantom God becoming what he wants us to be. That's why he is almighty. And I'm going to explore that as we go a bit further. That the point of might, the point of God being mighty, has always been interpreted in our own world. In our own way. Not God's way. So when we read, I am the Lord God almighty, in our mind, we think of destruction. We think of muscles. We think of might. But we are not thinking in the light of God's word. What was almighty in the world where the word was spoken, when it was spoken within the culture of the people where it was spoken? It cannot be the same with mighty today. That's what we're talking about. And whenever I say the Bible is an ancient book, that already gives an idea that it will require interpretation. <laughs> Stay with me. I am that I am. I will be what I will be. That lays the gauntlet that he will be the seed of the woman. He will be because sin has entered into the world, so the solution will come from God himself. I will be, so the solution comes from God. You cannot believe, for example, in the concept of God's promise, being fulfilled by himself. The word, the self-fulfilling promise. Self-fulfilling. He makes his promise, which he fulfills by himself. He doesn't promise and uses somebody to fulfill it. When he promises, within his promise, 
is his ability to fulfill the promise by himself. God's promises are self-fulfilling. So you can't believe that God will make a promise and fulfill it and not believe in the concept of the Trinity. That means you do not understand what God said. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. So God makes that promise to be the light in darkness. To be the seed in the earth. Bringing forth fruit after its kind. He said let's make man in our image after our likeness. Let them have dominion which is Genesis 1, 26 to 28. So in Genesis 22, Abraham takes his son Isaac to Mount Moriah. Please stay with me. Are you in the building? To Mount where? Moriah. This story has been misinterpreted or used differently in the body of Christ. But let's interpret it in the light of scripture. Let's interpret it where? In the light of scripture. So he calls Abraham in Genesis chapter 22 verse 1. Put it up for me. Genesis chapter 22 verse 1. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham. And he said, behold, here I am. Abraham. All right. This is how you will know that this story is figurative. Verse 2. Verse 2. And he said, take now thy son, thine only son, Isaac. Thine only. You don't need to go far to know that Isaac was not the only son. Just two chapters back, you will see that there was an Ishmael before Isaac. So for God to use thine only son means it is not literal. It's a figure. There is a communication here that you must pay attention to. Are we in the building? All right, now, so, by using the word Ben, B-E-N, only son, Ben, your, the Hebrew word, your only son is the word Ben, B-E-N, which is where we come to the epistles. When you come to the epistles, it is used as the only begotten son. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That only begotten son was gotten from Genesis 22 in that story of Abraham's journey to Mount Moriah. Pay attention here now. If you were sleeping, sleep more so that you won't hear what I didn't say. When we say son, many of us will go to the maternity, the maternity ward, where you look at the man and woman coming together to have a sexual relationship and have a child. That's your thinking of son. But you must sit where they sat to hear what they heard to understand what son is. The phrase son can be used for a people a person or an event in the world. The, the word Ben, B-E-N. That word Ben, son, can be used for a people, a person, or an event. Or an event. For example, Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. See the way it is used. Exodus 4, 22. Can we all read together like a mass choir, everybody? All right, I know you're writing, so I'm waiting for you. Exodus chapter 4, verse 22. Can we all read together? One to go. And thou shalt say unto Pharaoh, Thus saith the Lord, Israel, Israel, even. That's not English language. That's Bible language. Are you following here? Who is my son? What is Israel? And what is Israel? A people. So when he says son, don't think of that child in the maternity world. In Bible language. 
Son can mean a people, a person, or an event. Israel is my son, my firstborn. So you have to understand what son means. Son means someone who inherits your words, your actions, your failures, and your authority. That's the meaning of son. Someone who inherits your words, your actions, your failures, and your authority. And in this instance, God has no failures. So, he has his word, his actions, his promises. So, which means whoever will take the place of the son on himself and carry it out will be the son himself or will be God himself. So when he said, Israel is my son, my firstborn, it means Israel is that people or person or persons that I am going to walk through. Israel is that person or persons that I am going to walk through. So when you say son, son will mean this is how I am going to do it or this is through whom I am going to do it. The Hebrew word ben. So in Genesis 3.15, stay with me, Genesis 3.15, he says, I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and thy seed, he shall bruise thy head and thou shall bruise his heel. Remember, we came from Genesis chapter 22. How many of you remember? We came from Genesis 22. Take your only son. Only will be unique. Only. Unique. Only. The one who will fulfill it. The one who will fulfill it. Listen well, please. Pay attention. Much more attention. So go back to Genesis chapter 4. <clears throat> Where Eve heard the seed of the woman will bruise the head of the serpent. Question. What did Eve hear? Huh? Say it to me very loud. I want you to repeat it so that I'm sure you're following. What did Eve hear? Huh? The seed of the woman shall what? Okay, say it very loud. Let the radio and TV audience hear your voices. What did Eve hear? So she had the seed of the woman. Automatically, she thought she was the woman whose seed will bruise the head of the serpent. The seed of the woman. God spoke it to even Adam in their falling state. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent. Wow. I beg you stay with me. The seed of the woman. When Eve had the seed of the woman, remember they had two children, Cain and Abel. In Genesis chapter 4 verse 1 and 2, they had Cain and Abel. In their culture, it's your first child, male child, because they had a highly patriarchal system. First child, firstborn son, must be a male to take over the inheritance. But in Genesis 1, 26 to 28, Moses corrected that. He said, male and female created them and blessed them. And said, be fruitful. So Moses already corrected that within the context of God's promise and God's plan. That it was not going to be male, it was going to be male and female. That is to sort out that disparity that has come in human culture. So when they had two sons, normally in their culture, the firstborn male child will be the one to inherit the father's property. That was their culture. So what did God do? Let me fast track because of time. It's Abel, not Cain. It's Isaac, not Ishmael. It's Jacob, not Esau. It's Joseph, not Reuben. You didn't follow me. It 
Is Abel, not Cain. Is Isaac, not Ishmael. Is Jacob, not Esau. Is Joseph, not Reuben. Which means even though human beings regard your son as your biological first child, God is saying, no, it is the believer in the gospel that is my son. It is the believer in the gospel that is my son. So that is the entire Genesis principle. That is, it is by grace, not by works. It is by grace, not by merit. Their own culture, firstborn is first male child. That, that wasn't deliberately reversed by God. But it happens that humans, human works does not qualify for God's blessedness. It is only faith in his promise. So again, Eve makes the assumption she thinks it is Cain. Okay? She thinks it is Cain that is the seed of the woman that will bruise the head of the serpent. That's what Eve is thinking. She thought that this is the man. Unfortunately, it was the second male child that offered the firstborn sacrifice. That's again figurative. Again what? That means it was Abel who recognized the office of God's servanthood. Please, I need you to listen carefully. Then quickly, he found out that Cain killed Abel. Cain killed Abel. Then Eve had another child in Genesis 4.25. Watch what she said. Genesis 4.25. And Adam knew his wife again and she bore a son and called his name Seth. Look at what she said. For God said she had appointed me another seed instead of Abel whom Cain slew another seed. So Eve believes that she is the woman that will produce the seed that will bruise the head of the serpent. She thought it was Cain. Then Cain killed Abel. And she knew that the seed that will bruise the head of the serpent cannot be a killer. So she left Cain and waited for another child. And when the child came, she gave him a name Seth, saying, this is the guy. This is the seed. That will bruise the head of the serpent. These are Eve's assumptions. Why? Because she knew that Cain killing Abel, Cain can't be the seed. Because the seed of the woman is not supposed to be a killer. He is supposed to crush death. The seed of the woman is supposed to put an end to death. Not to kill. Because man's failure put him in death. So if God is going to redeem man, ultimately the redemption will be from death. So the seed of the woman will be a, a, a terminator of death. Alright, so it cannot be Cain. Now she thinks it is said. She talks, you know, Eve talks a lot. You know, she's the one who spoke to the serpent. <laughs> what a wife. <laughs> Even when the husband is there, her mouth is running like a broken pa. Broken ta. Did God say she shall not eat of the Yes, God said we shall not eat here and there. She just talks. May God not give you that kind of wife. Even if you have, may she be delivered from mythology. <laughs> be delivered from what? Where did that come from? <laughs> came from Pastor Prince. <laughs> she just talks too much. So when Adam, are you still in the building? He 
you know, I have to check because I was given an eternal clock. <laughs> Glory to God. So after a while, Eve discovered that Seth is not it. <laughs> so when they discovered that it is not Seth, they had another one. Adam named him Enos. The meaning of Enos is mortal. This one is mortal. It can be the word. <laughs> it has dawned on them now that they are not the ones that will produce the seed of the woman. She called him Enos. Mortal. Death ruled. They know that it was not any of them. Abraham in Genesis 15 said to God, let it be Eliezer. I'm old. Sarah is old. It has ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. You promised us a child. So since we can't produce a child, let Eliezer, our house boy, be or let Eliezer's wife produce the seed. And God said, mm -mm. Abraham, I promise to have a seed from you and Sarah. And it is deliberate, it is intentional, that it will not come when two of you are capable of producing. Which foreshadows the resurrection. He said, that's how I'm going to do it. The seed of the woman will come as a miracle. He will not come as efforts or human ability. He will come as a miracle from the dead. So Isaac comes and then to demonstrate to Isaac again, he goes to Mount Moriah in Genesis 22 verse 2. Please pay attention. He says, take your only son, which means that's it's a kind of communication that you must understand. Now let's go back to Genesis chapter 4 again. Are you still here? So, where it is not Cain, it's Abel. Abel was killed by Cain. Then Genesis chapter 5 verse 3. Pay attention, Genesis chapter 5 verse number 3. And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and called his name Seth, likeness, his own image. So he called his name Seth after his image, after his likeness, which means what is going on here cannot be Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Okay? Because Genesis 1, 26 to 28 is in God's image and God's likeness. But now Adam and Eve have discovered that they are now producing after their own image and their own likeness which automatically rules out that from Adam's family immediate family there will be no seed of the woman is it getting clear so which means that every human being is not the image of God so don't go around telling people you know all of us are in the image of God Ta, are you in power city or are you in a place that looks like power city? How can you be in power city and be saying everybody is the image of God? Everybody is not the image of God. Adam had his own image and his own likeness. You are the image and the likeness of your father. From Mbo. You too. You too Mbam. Oyo. Kaduna. Borono. Urwan. You know a lot of magical things happen in Urwan. I didn't say it's my kebush who told us. <laughs> so which means the image of God and the likeness of God will not be Eve and Adam and their children. So how then is it going to happen? God calls a man Abraham and he says in you shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Then he mentions to Abraham it's going to come through your seed. 
Keep that somewhere. We will come back to it. In Genesis chapter 4, we find out that Cain killed Abel. Actually, Satan did. Because in Genesis 3.15, it says, is the seed of the devil. The seed of the devil. Child of the serpent or a child of disobedience. Jesus will put it like this in John 8, 44. Put it up. John chapter 8, verse number 44. Jesus says, you have your father, the devil. And the loss of your father, you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. Beginning where did Satan murder? Cain and Abel. He was a murderer from Genesis. Genesis 4. And abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. For he is a liar and the father of it. Jesus, when he was being accused by the Jews and the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they called him names. Then he told them in verse 40 of John chapter 8. We're going to read from, from verse 40 to 42. Pay attention to John chapter 8 verse 40. But now you seek to kill me. A man that have told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then said they to him, we be not born of fornication. That's an insult. We have one father, even God. What they are saying is, we don't know who your father is. Your mother just got pregnant. And nobody knew from where. And your, your stepfather just covered it up. We we know our biological father. We didn't come from fornication. What they are saying is you. You are a child of fornication. That's an insult. Okay, watch. Jesus said unto them, If God were your father, you will love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Can you see how to handle people who criticize and attack you? The more they attack you, just maintain your position. Keep saying what you know to say. They say you are born of fornication. They say, I came from God. If your father was God, he would love me. Because that's where I came from. So the fact that you don't love me means you came from a different place and I came from God. Wherever you came from must be from Satan. I love Jesus. You know, we're preaching the gospel. Let's not be confrontational. What is this? This is not only confrontation. This is insultive confrontation. And this is the master you're supposed to follow. And you're avoiding confrontation. There are people you must confront them and remove the rug from under their leg. They use small to collect big. You understand? If you don't understand, don't, don't worry. If you don't get it, For I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Next verse. Why do you not understand my speech? Even because you cannot hear my word. Next verse. You are of your father the devil. You are of your father who? <laughs> and the loss of your father you will do for your father was a murderer from the beginning. So, I'm not surprised that you, his children, are looking for how to kill me. The proof that your father was a murderer is that even now, all of you are thinking of how to kill me. That's what Jesus implied. Don't you love Jesus? He was a murderer. The word murderer there is the word anthropokutonos. You can write down A N T H R O A N T H R O P O K T O N O S Anthropoctonos. It means a man killer. He was a man killer from the beginning. It shows you that death emerged from the devil. In first John chapter three, verse eight, John repeats it. First John chapter three, verse number eight. He that committed sin is of the devil, for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now pay attention here. So if he was a man killer, 
The killer was a man himself who was Cain. Because the people is referring to here are men. What man is Jesus referring to? In Genesis chapter 4 verse 4, Moses records that Abel offered a firstling. What many of us have read it to mean is that Abel offered suya. <laughs> Abel gave God suya. Cain brought salad. <laughs> God said, no, I like suya. I don't like salad. Cain <laughs> brought vegetable. Abel brought animal with blood. And God said, I love blood. Yeah, I love drinking blood. <laughs> oh God. Moses again is writing in figures of speech. The word firstlings. Remember what God called Israel. He called them what? His firstborn. The same Hebrew word for firstling. Firstborn means someone who will take your promises, your service, your ministry, and bring it to pass. That's the meaning of firstborn. Someone who will take your promises, your service, your ministry, and bring it to pass. If you go to Genesis 25, 31 to 34, Remember the conversation between Jacob and Esau. You know, because many of us think that birthright is property. If birthright was property, how did the father make mistake and give it to the second son? If it was property, all the father needs to do after the mistake is say, come, I changed my mind, let's change the property. After all, it's a document aside. So, the, the blessing of, of the father upon the children there cannot be property. He had, he laid his hands and prayed for him to pronounce. Which shows you it's not a material inheritance. He laid hands to impart the blessing. So the firstborn therefore is the one who will stand in your office. Take your duties and responsibilities and your inheritance. That's the firstborn. That's the firstborn. Which is the mission of the blessing of God in the earth. Now pay attention. So Abel believed the promise of God's blessing. He believed the promise of God's service. Abel then offered to serve in the gospel. Abel offering the firstling means Abel accepted to preach the gospel. He offered to fulfill God's mandate. Of being a blessing on the earth. And because of that Cain hated him. So Cain hated a servant of God. Is that clear? Cain's hatred for Abel. Is that Abel has now joined the ministry. Abel has now offered himself to be a man of God and preach the gospel. So Cain hated Abel's new assignment. Because Abel offered the firstling, firstborn, which signify an offering to accept to be in ministry, to serve the purpose of God. So Cain hated a prophet of God. Cain hated a preacher of the gospel. You will see that same phrase used in 1 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 1. 1 Chronicles chapter 5 verse number 1. Now the sons of Reuben, the firstborn of Israel, for he was the firstborn, but for as much as he did defile his father's bed, his birthright was given unto the sons of Joseph, the son of Israel. And the genealogy is not to be reckoned after the birthright. He was denied being the firstborn.
to take on the responsibilities of the father. So firstborn means to accept the call, the responsibility, the office, the actions, the words, and the promises. So don't go around saying Abel offered blood and cane vegetables. His birthright, the word Bekorai in the Hebrew means the promise of redemption will go through Abel. In 1 Chronicles chapter 5 verse 2, where we just read, verse 2 of it. For Judah prevailed above his brethren and of him came the chief ruler, but the birthright was Joseph's. Now, Ezra, please pay attention. Ezra wrote in a world more understandable to his own time. You know, in First and Second Samuel, when Samuel was writing, you will see that Samuel wrote something like, and the Lord provoked David, and he numbered Israel, and then the Lord punished him. Which means that God is the creator of evil and the punisher of evil, which makes God an evil, God an evil person. But Ezra, Ezra will bring clarity. Ezra said, Satan provoked David, not God. Why? Because in ancient Hebrew language, there was no difference between the causative verbs and the permissive verbs. Causative and permissive verbs. There was no difference. So, the person who caused it and the person who permitted it, all of them were treated the same. But Ezra separated that for us in Chronicles by making it clear that it was Satan that provoked David. So right here in Ezra makes the distinction for us on what the birthright was. The birthright was service and responsibility. So what Abel offered, the word offering means service and worship service and worship so abel offered to serve in god's promise of redemption abel offered to serve in god's promise of redemption cain did not cain hated abel and that already set the tone Remember in Genesis 3.15, I will make enmity between your seed and her seed. So Jesus, by identifying the Pharisees and Sadducees as children of Satan, is telling them, you are going to kill me because I am here because of the blessing. You are going to kill me because I am God's prophet, I am God's servant. So in Matthew 23.34, pay attention, Matthew Chapter 23, verse number 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them you shall kill and crucify, and some of them shall use scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city. Look at Luke eleven forty-nine to 51. Luke eleven forty-nine to 51. Therefore also said the wisdom of God, I will send them prophets and apostles, and some of them they shall slay and persecute. That the blood of all the prophets which was shed, the blood of how many prophets? How many prophets? All the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation. Which prophets? Next verse. From the blood of who? Abel. So Abel was a prophet. He accepted the office of the prophet of God to preach the blessing. And Cain hated Abel for accepting the call to serve the purpose of God. So Cain killing Abel was persecution for the gospel. And that is where it started from. That was the origin of persecution against Christ. So the first antichrist in the Bible was Cain. The first antichrist. And we have many antichrists today all over the place. It's not one man. It is anybody that denies the deity or the humanity of Christ that is an antichrist. So who was Abel? 
a prophet. So when he offered the firstling, he was offering himself as a prophet of God to carry out God's promise, to carry out God's purpose, to carry out God's blessings on the earth. So from Genesis chapter 4, it was clear to us that evil and the devil, you know, together will kill the Messiah. It's clear. So that sets forth a principle of persecution. And that's where we have to, you know, the doctrine of the Antichrist, like I said, from. The doctrine of the Antichrist is not only found in Matthew. It started from Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. He shall bruise your head, you shall bruise his heel. Genesis chapter 4. God told Cain clearly, Behold, sin lieth at your door. So he deliberately knew what he was doing and he accepted to do it. That's where you have the doctrine of the Antichrist. The one who opposes Christ. See how some translation makes it look like a person. But the Antichrist is not a person. The Antichrist is a belief system that can be in people and it can be in institutions. People who doubt the gospel. Antichrist is in the four gospels. Antichrist is in Genesis. Antichrist is in Exodus. And there are Antichrists in Uyo today. So Jesus, as I round off this service, I still have yet many things to say to you and you will bear them. John 8, 56. Are you enjoying this? If you are shout glory. John 8, 56. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day and he saw it and was glad. Next verse. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not yet 50 years old. And has thou seen Abraham? Next verse. Everybody read with me very loud. One to go. Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Before Abraham was, I am. In English, it will be before Abraham was, I was. But in Bible language, Before Abraham was, I am. I was, I will be, I am. So before Abraham, I am. During Abraham, I am. After Abraham, I am. In the future, I am. That's not English. That's Bible language. It means consistently, constantly the same. Meaning I, 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 I am the one who was there in Genesis 1. I am the one who said male and female. Created them after the image had to die in the place of Isaac. It is after Abraham. I am the one that walked the streets of Jerusalem. And I said to them, I am the bread of life. I am the water of life. He that drinketh me shall never thirst. I am, I am, I am. And in today's English, I was, I am, and I will be what I will be because I am what I am. And it rests upon the story of salvation. So I am what I am because I will be what I will be for the purpose of salvation. You didn't get that. I am what I am. And because I am the all sufficient one. Anything that will be needed to save man. I will be. If I have to be a man. I will be a man. If I have to die and rise. I will die and rise. And if I have to enter man as spirit. I will become Holy Spirit to live in man. Why? I am what I am. Because I will be what I will be. All to save man. That's the love of God demonstrated in God becoming anything he is supposed to be to ensure that man is saved. How many of you understand what I'm teaching this morning? He is the same person. But because somebody has to die to save man, God cannot die. He is God. That's why nobody can kill him. 
So if he comes as God to save man, he will not achieve the purpose. But man has to die to save man because man sinned. So God became man. Why? I am that I am. I will be what I will be for the purpose of salvation. So he became a man. Walk the streets of Jerusalem as a man. And to show you that he is the one that spoke to Moses in the burning. bush he said lo he rose from the dead he became holy spirit entered inside you and secured the territory that you obtained in his dead burial and resurrection and nobody nobody can overthrow his territory he is the conqueror he is the emperor he is the sustainer of his territory that's why he could confidently say i give unto you eternal life and you shall never perish none shall be able to pluck you out of my hand my father that gave you to me is greater than all and none can take you out of my father's hand somebody bless this morning get on your feet shout glory Woo! i tell you man i'm enjoying this is it, are the scriptures coming alive is the word of god opening up to you lift your right hands father we pray for everybody under the sound of my voice in this service online on television on radio right now that revelation grows big this reality is registered well we are grounded and rooted and built up we are kept secured reinforced in our faith in christ and we rejoice we rejoice that the gospel is getting clearer by the day and that we're able to defend this message and communicate it effectively in a winsome manner. And I give you praise for your word. Now sick bodies be healed. Be healed. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you praise. In Jesus' precious name. And every believer says that amen like you know what you just received. Can we celebrate this word this morning for a few minutes? Is that how you celebrate? Is that how you celebrate? Glory! Amen. Listen to me quickly. I want to first of all thank all of you for celebrating me last Monday. I mean, you guys were all over the place. All over the place. The whole world knew that I was celebrated. I mean, all of social media, there was traffic everywhere. Yeah. There was traffic. And I want to thank all of you. All of you who took the time to honor me, celebrate me. Those of you who sent me gifts, gave me money, gave me food, gave me all kinds of stuff. I want you to know I truly appreciate the honor you gave to me. You know, but that is right. What you did is the right thing to do. And what you did shows that you're understanding the Bible. Because one of the proof of understanding the scriptures is that you begin to walk in honor. When the scriptures begin to get clear, Honor becomes a lifestyle. See, if somebody has not started walking in honor, he has not understood the scriptures. Jesus said, into whatever house you enter, anything they give to you, that means that when people really understand the gospel, they will give you something. They will give you something. One of the pastors who came here for Bible school went on evangelism in town. And after preaching to the man, the man owns a boutique. The man said, man of God, enter this boutique take any suit you like i want to preach like you he doesn't know him he met him for the first time and he gave him a suit some of them were giving food some of them were giving drinks some of them were giving money people they are meeting for the first time just the sound of the good news of the gospel made people to give one of the ways to know that what we are preaching to you your understanding practically is that it begins to command honor you begin to feel indebted. Then now you want to give. You want to reach out. You want to honor. You want to bless the vessel that God is using to minister to you. You know, when they saw Jesus on a donkey riding into Jerusalem, what did they do? They brought out gold, clothes, and put on the ground. And it was not Jesus that rode on the things. It was the donkey. See that? It was not Jesus. So you being grateful for what Jesus has done will be expressed through you to me whom Jesus is using to carry out his purpose in your lives. I mean, if you understand what I'm saying. 
Sometimes somebody says, are you people not even worshipping this Damina? That's not worship. There's a difference between worship and honor. There are two different things. You're honoring me, but you're worshipping Jesus for the gift of me to your lives. How many of you understand what I just said? Now? You know, so I want to thank you and I want to appreciate all of you who gave, who reached out. You know, you, you did it for me. You did it for Jesus. You, you know, and uh, it's just a proof that you're understanding. And it will make, you, make me teach you much more. Much more is coming. Woto, woto. It's coming from everywhere. Let me also use the opportunity to appreciate those of you who have started redeeming your commitments towards our project, our, you know, second half of the year project. I want to thank you. And those of you who requested for the extension, we've extended it by two weeks, you know, so you still have till next Sunday to redeem your commitments towards our project for this second half. We have quite a number of things we want to do for the ministry, for this ministry to carry our vision to the ends of the earth. And if you are not here when we raise the money, you still want to be a part of it since there's an extension, you can still take advantage of the opportunity to give to our project. It's our second half of the year project. And our budget is about 235,000 US dollars. So whatever you want to give, $100, $500, $1,000, $10,000, even if you want to give you $100,000, you know, whatever you want to give, it's for the cause of Jesus Christ. It is for the purpose of God. You want to give. You know, we don't preach giving in this church like giving. We just teach you and we know you will do what you need to do. So if you want to give today, shoot a mail to Dr. Abel Damina at yahoo.com. And we will send you another mail with all the banking details through which you will give your, 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 your commitment to our second half of the year project. We love you and we thank God for all of you that are giving and redeeming and, you know, doing all you do to help us do what we do for the kingdom of God. Today is the first Sunday of September, and we want to pray for all our partners today. You know, we're going to pray for partners in the building, and we're going to pray for, you know, all of you around the world. But just before we sign you off, Father, we pray for all partners around the world, people who continually, sacrificially, in our campuses, online, on television, on radio, continually give to this ministry, because we all believe in this cause. We believe in this assignment. We believe in this mandate to get the truth of the gospel out there where falsehood had become a, a, the order of the day. To shine this light in the midst of darkness. Everyone giving, Lord, I pray that each one giving the grace of God, the sufficiency of God, and God's ability continues to walk through you. Your needs are met supernaturally. Doors open up to you. We decree that you continue to enjoy the abundance of God's grace. You excel in your profession. You excel in the work of your hands in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Father, for the blessing upon all our partners all over the world and many more who are going to join us as partners. We thank you that supernaturally you're bringing them in touch with this ministry and together we'll do much more for the glory of Jesus. Thank you for answered prayer in Jesus' name. And every believer sees the power. Amen. All partners, thank you. Thank you for partnering with us so together we can do more for the kingdom of God. All right, grab your honor offerings. Let's give this morning as we worship Jesus, the risen Lord. Remember, the next service will be 11. We are bringing into our understanding. So our offerings. Before your sweet smell today. In G you drop your offerings, I'm sure. We trust that you have been blessed by this message. To order the complete series of this message and all the messages by Dr. Abel Daminer, please call plus 234-806-800-9939 or email powercityoffice at gmail.com.